In this lecture, we're going to continue looking at collisions, and then we're going to have a look at rotational motion. The textbook reference for this lecture is sections 9.6 to 9.9 .9 and 10.1 to 10.5 of your textbook. First of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas from the last lecture. In the last lecture, we were looking at how to calculate the centre of mass. So we saw for discrete objects, the centre of mass can be found using that the x location of the centre of mass is equal to 1 over the total mass times the sum of the mass of each of the components times the position of each of those components. And we saw that a similar equation applies in each dimension. For continuous objects, we need to break our big object up into lots of little small increments, each with a mass dm, and we can find the center of mass using 1 over m is equal to the integral of x dm. Now we saw that the velocity of the center of mass is given by a similar equation. The velocity of the center of mass is given by 1 over m times the sum of the masses multiplied by the velocities of each of the particles. And we saw that Newton's second law also applies to systems. So the acceleration of the center of mass is given by the sum of the external forces divided by the total mass. So if there is no external forces acting upon the system, then the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. First of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas we encountered last lecture. In the last lecture, we learned about linear momentum and saw that it's given by the equation P, which is our symbol for linear momentum, is equal to mv. And momentum is a vector in the same direction as the velocity vector. We saw that net force is related to the momentum by the net force is equal to ma, that's Newton's second law, which is equal to m dv dt, which is equal to dp dt. So the change in the momentum over time is equal to the net force. We saw that net momentum of a system of particles is given by just the sum of all the momentums of each individual particle, which we can write as the sum of mi vi. And so we saw that we could relate this to the velocity of the center of mass. So the net momentum was equal to the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass. We saw that impulse is useful and it's given the symbol J or sometimes I and it's equal to the integral of the force with respect to time. So the change in momentum is the impulse. So if we know how the force changes with time, we can work out how the momentum changes. And we saw that when no external forces act, the momentum is conserved. This must be so because this thing is then zero. So the impulse and the change in momentum are both zero. Okay, so we started this lecture with a fun demo where we asked what would happen to this cylinder and most people thought that the cylinder would roll down the slope, which is usually correct, but this was a, actually a special cylinder with an unbalanced mass. So when I let go of it, it actually rolled up the slope. So it actually had a higher mass up here, so the center of mass could move down, moving the cylinder itself up the slope. Okay, so we're looking at collisions, so different types of collisions. There's different ways that we can classify collisions. So in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. And then we've got inelastic collisions where some kinetic energy is lost. And there's something which is called a perfectly or completely inelastic collision in which the colliding particles stick together and so have the same final velocity. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll write down equations to describe a collision between two particles in one dimension for each of these different situations. And then in the lecture we had a look at some demonstrations. So this will be very useful for you for the laboratory exercise collisions and car crashing. But let's go write down these equations now. Okay, so in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. So we're going to write down the equations that describe the collision between two particles. So momentum is conserved. So we've got m1, u1, where u1 stands for the initial velocity of body 1, plus m2, u2 is equal to m1, v1, where v1 stands for the final velocity, and m2, v2. And we've also got the equation a half m1, 
u1 squared plus a half m2 u2 squared equals a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared. So we can cancel out the factors of a half in this case and end up with the equation m1 u1 squared plus m2 u2 squared equals m1 v1 squared plus m2 v2 squared. So for an elastic collision, both this first equation and the second equation must hold. Now in an inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. So in this case, we've got just equation A holds. This is A plus B. And in a perfectly or completely inelastic collision, then the particles stick together. So then we can write for our momentum conservation equation, m1u1 plus m2u2 is equal to, now because they're sticking together, they're moving off with the same speed. So we've got the same final speed for the two bodies. So we can write it this way. So this is the equation that describes what happens in a perfectly inelastic collision. B does not apply because the kinetic energy is lost. So in this problem, we've got a projectile proton here with a speed of 500 meters per second, which collides elastically with a target proton initially at rest. So let's color our target proton over here red. And our projectile proton here has an initial speed of 500 meters per second. Then after they collide, the two protons then move along perpendicular paths with the projectile path at 60 degrees from the original direction. Okay, so after the collision, this one's going off at 60 degrees. That's this one here. And the target one is at right angles to it. So that means this angle in here is 30 degrees. And this is our target proton here. And we're asked after the collision, what are the speeds of the target proton? And we'll need to also find the projectile proton. Okay, so in this collision, it's elastic. So we've got momentum and kinetic energy conserved. So momentum is conserved. And since momentum is a vector, that means it's conserved in the x direction, which let's take this as the x direction. And it's also conserved in the y direction. So in x direction, we can write, well, initially, the target, the projectile proton is moving with a speed of 500 meters per second. So we can say mass of the proton times u. And then afterwards, both of these have some velocity in the x direction. So we can split their velocities into horizontal and vertical. So we can split their velocities into horizontal and vertical components. So let's label this one v1 and label this one v2. So horizontally we've got v1 cos 60. So this is mp times v1 cos 60 plus this one here is also a proton, so it's also got mass mp times v2 cos 30. And you can see that the mass of the protons are going to cancel out everywhere. So we can write this as v1 on 2 because cos 60 is a half plus v2 root 3 on 2. And now in y direction, Initially, there is no momentum, so we've got zero. And then afterwards, these two have opposite y components. So we have mp times v1 sine 60. We'll take up as positive, minus mp v2 sine 30. So we can write this as v1 times sine 60, which is root 3 on 2 is equal to v2 times sine 30, which is on 2. So we have v2 is equal to v1 root 3. So let's look at, substitute this back into our x direction formula here. So rewriting this, we've got u is 500. So we've got 500 is equal to v1 on 2 plus 
v2 which is equal to v1 root 3 so v1 root 3 times root 3 on 2 so we can say well multiplying everything by 2 we've got 1000 is equal to v1 plus root 3 times root 3 that's 3 v1 so this is equal to 4v1. So that tells us that v1 is equal to 1,000 over 4, which is equal to 250 meters per second. So that is actually the answer to b, because that was the v1 was the speed of the projectile. So this is 250 meters per second. And then the target, that's v2. So we've got v2 is equal to root 3 v1. So that tells us that v2 is equal to root 3 times 250 which is equal to 433 meters per second so this is 433 meters per second now we should just check our answer because we didn't actually use when we were coming up with this that it was a completely elastic collision so because it's a completely elastic collision it tells us that kinetic energy should be conserved so we should check K is conserved. So we've got initially, we've got a half MP times the initial velocity squared, which is 500 squared, and that's equal to the final velocities, and we've calculated the final velocities here. So that's a half MP times 433 squared plus a half MP times 250 squared. We can cancel out the half MPs, and we've got 500 squared, which is 250,000, which is equal to, when I do it on my calculator, I get 249,989. So within our significant figures, this is absolutely right. So it does look like we have performed this calculation correctly. So we then looked at the ballistic pendulum. The ballistic pendulum is when we shoot a bullet into a block which is free to swing up like a pendulum. So the question was, when the bullet collides with the block, is momentum conserved and is mechanical energy conserved? So when the bullet collides with the block, momentum is conserved because external forces are negligible. The forces come from the bullet on the block, so those are internal forces. Now, is mechanical energy conserved? Well, no, it's not. I mean, if you hear a bullet colliding with anything it tends to be quite loud so it's losing energy through sound energy um, there tends to be a lot of friction as well so energy is generally not conserved um, and then it says when the block and bullet rise is momentum conserved so then we had the bullet embedded in the block and then it started to rise and in that case momentum is not conserved because gravity is acting on it to slow it down and that's a significant external force and then is mechanical energy conserved? Well, it is in that case because gravity is acting, but it's not a non-conservative force. So in fact, non-conservative forces aren't significant as after the collision. They're only significant during the collision. So then we had a look at the ballistic pendulum, which we will do very shortly. But um, And we calculated the initial velocity of the bullet from how high the ballistic pendulum went. Now to practice this for Physics 1A, try questions 4 and 5 in set 3. And for higher Physics 1A, try questions 5 and 6 in set 3. So this demonstration is of a ballistic pendulum. So in this case, I've got a bullet which is loaded here. I've pulled this spring back. So at the moment, there's a lot of potential energy stored in that spring, which I'm going to release very soon. That's going to give the bullet some initial velocity. The bullet will then shoot into this block of paraffin here and hopefully become embedded in it. So during that collision, the momentum is conserved. The initial momentum of the bullet goes into the final momentum of the bullet plus the paraffin. At that point, the paraffin block with the bullet in it begins to move 
and it continues to move up until all its kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy. So we can use the height it moves to to calculate the amount of kinetic energy it initially had, and then we can go back from that kinetic energy it initially had, we can calculate how much speed the bullet had when it was launched into the paraffin block. So in this case, my bullet has a mass of 7.7 .7 grams, my paraffin block has a mass of 76.4 grams, and the length of the string from the pivot point up here to the center of mass of the paraffin block is 22.5 centimeters. So we'll be using those numbers later to do our calculation. But let's have a look at this demonstration. Okay, so we can see that it rose to an angle of, just let me jump around here, it rose to an angle of 34 degrees. So we can see it rose to an angle of 34 degrees, so we can use that to perform our calculation now. So we're considering our ballistic pendulum. So initially we've got the paraffin block and we'll let it have mass MP here and we've got the bullet traveling towards it with some initial speed ub and we'll say that the mass of the bullet is given by mb so as the bullet collides with the paraffin assume momentum is conserved. So momentum will be conserved, linear momentum will be conserved if external forces aren't playing a significant role in this, and they're not. We've got the gravitational force acting on the system, but that is very small compared to all of the internal forces involved. So then the bullet becomes stuck in the paraffin block and the paraffin block moves up. So eventually it moves up to some height. Let's call that H where it comes to rest. And from when it starts moving to when it comes to rest, we can assume that mechanical energy is conserved. So we've basically got kinetic energy being converted into potential energy. Okay, so let's write down the equation to describe this first step. We've said that the momentum is conserved. So the initial momentum, the paraffin is stationary, so the momentum is all in the bullet. So the initial momentum is given by the mass of the bullet times the speed of the bullet. And this is equal to the final speed of the bullet plus the paraffin. So mass of bullet plus mass of paraffin times the final speed. So this gives us the speed just after that bullet has embedded itself in the paraffin. And now we consider the second part where they're now moving together as one object and energy is conserved. So here we've got that the initial kinetic energy, which is a half mass of the bullet plus the mass of the paraffin, times v squared, which was the speed we just calculated here. And then at the end, we've got all the energy in the form of potential energy. So this is the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the paraffin times g times h. So now, if we let l be the length of our piece of string from the pivot point to the center of mass, that's l, then along here, we've got the same l here. And this is the theta here that we've measured. So this length here is equal to L cos theta. And so this length plus this length here is L. So this tells us that the height H is equal to L minus L cos theta. Theta. So we'll be able to use that for the h here. But what we can see is this will cancel off nicely. So we've got v squared is equal to 2gh, just rearranging this second equation here. And what we're trying to find is the initial speed of the bullet. So try, so we want to find ub. Okay, so let's call this one equation a. And we'll call this one equation B.
So equation A, we can rearrange and we can write, well, UB is equal to MB plus MP over MB times V. And then in equation B, we've worked out what V squared is, so we can just substitute in the square root of that for V. So this is equal to MB plus MP over MB times the square root of 2GH. So that was sub in B. Okay, so now we can actually evaluate this because we measured all these things. So the mass of the bullet was 7.7 .7 grams. The mass of the paraffin was 76.4 grams. So that's in grams. The mass of the bullet, 7.7 .7 grams. So we've got grams on the top and grams on the bottom. So the units cancel each other out. So we don't need to worry about converting this into kilograms. You can if you want. You won't get it wrong, but we can save ourselves some time. And then we t times it by the square root of 2 times gravity, which is 9.80 times h. And for h, we were using L minus L cos theta. So this is L minus L cos theta, which we can pull L out and the front and it's L1 minus cos theta. So this is times L, which was, we measured it, L was equal to 22.5 centimeters. So this is 0 0.225 meters. We do need to be in SI units here because we're not dividing by an L. And then we multiply it by one minus cos theta and we measure theta to be 34 degrees. So we can substitute this into the calculator and we end up with 9.48 meters per second. We should just give it to two significant figures because a lot of the data was only measured to two significant figures. So this is 9.5 meters per second as the initial speed of the bullet as it embedded itself in the paraffin. So far when we've been considering momentum, we've been considering systems where the mass doesn't change. But this isn't always the case. A nice example is a rocket. So imagine the rocket on the launch pad. Quite a lot of the mass of the rocket is made up as its fuel. Now when the rocket takes off, there aren't really external forces acting on the rocket. Well, there's gravity which it has to overcome. But that's very small compared to the internal forces from expelling the fuel. So as the rocket launches, the rocket gains an outwards momentum because the fuel it has a downwards momentum. So overall, the total momentum of that rocket fuel system isn't changing, it's still zero, but the rocket itself is gaining momentum because it's expelling the fuel. So let's have a look at how we can calculate the acceleration of the rocket as it expels the fuel. Okay, so let's consider our rocket. Let's draw our rocket here. This is the initial rocket. It's got mass m and it's traveling in this direction with some speed v. Now, time t later. Here is our rocket. Again, now it's sped up a little bit. Its speed is now v plus dv. But in order to speed up, it's had to lose some of its mass. So its mass is now m minus dm. But that mass hasn't just disappeared into thin air. We've got fuel going back this way with speed u, and it's got mass dm. So that's where the missing mass has gone to. Now, the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And when we say that, we're talking about this system and this system. So we're including the fuel in this final momentum. Okay, so we can write MV is equal to, now we've got the fuel, the fuel is going in the opposite direction, so the negative direction. So the momentum of the fuel is equal to minus dm u. And the rocket also has momentum going forwards. So the mass of the rocket is m minus dm. And the speed of the rocket 
is V plus dV. So this is the final momentum of the rocket fuel system. Now, this we can simplify a bit if we consider the relative, the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So we've looked at relative velocities before. We've seen that the velocity of A relative to B was equal to the velocity of A minus the velocity of B. And in this case, we're looking at the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So this will be the velocity of the rocket, which is now V plus dV minus the velocity of the fuel. And the velocity of the fuel is minus u. The minus because it's going in the opposite direction. So this is equal to v plus dv plus u. So that gives us the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So we'll just rearrange this and we'll say, well, the velocity of the fuel is equal to the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel minus v minus dv. And now that we've rearranged that, we're going to substitute this back up into this expression here. So we have mv is equal to minus dm. Now that's times u. So minus dm times v rel plus dm times v plus dm dv. So that is this term here. And then we've still got the remaining terms. So as we write these down, these terms here, we're going to expand the brackets. So we've got plus mv plus mdv minus dmv minus dmdv. Now we have so many terms and it's so messy. But a lot of these will cancel out. So let's cancel the mouse in yellow so we can still kind of see them. So we've got dmdv with a negative, and here it is with a positive. So that disappears. Here's mv on the left-hand side, and here it is again on the right-hand side. Now we've got a dmv here and a minus dmv here. So at the end of all that cancellation, we're left with this term and this term. So let's rearrange that, and we have dmv rel is equal to mdv, where this thing here is the mass lost from rocket, and this thing here is the mass of the rocket. Now, we can actually make this into a nice rocket equation if we divide through by dt. So let's divide through by dt. We've got dm dt v rel is equal to m dv dt. And why this is a nice rocket equation is, well, we know that dv dt, that is the acceleration. dm dt, that's the mass lost from the rocket. So we can actually give that a symbol r, which is the rate at which it's losing mass. So we've got r times the relative velocity between the rocket and the fuel is equal to ma. So this is our rocket equation. And it tells us about how quickly a rocket accelerates. Now, the other thing we might care about for our rocket is, well, how fast is it actually going? So if at time t initial, the rocket has mass m initial and it has a speed v initial, then at time t final, the rocket has mass m final and the rocket has speed v final. Well, what is the change in velocity? To do that, we can once again use this equation here. It's just we need to make both terms on this equation, both the, the terms on the other side, be talking about the same thing so that we can integrate. Now, at the moment, this is the mass lost from the rocket. And on the right-hand side, we've got the mass of the rocket. So if we want to do the change of mass of the rocket instead of considering 
this, we're going to consider this part, then that mass is actually lost. So we should write this as dm v rel is equal to m dv. And in this case, this dm, this is the change in mass of the rocket itself. Okay, so what we want to do is just integrate this and we've got here our limits for our integral. So let's rearrange and then integrate. So I'll just scroll up to get some more room. Sorry, picture. Okay, so we have minus dm on m times v rel is equal to dv. And now we're integrating and we've said that when we have speed v initial, the mass of the rocket is m initial. When we have speed v final, the mass of the rocket is mass m final. And so solving this, when we integrate a one on x function, we end up with a log x. So this is equal to minus v rel, because that's a constant, times log m from m initial to m final is equal to this thing, which is just v from v initial to v final. So this is equal to minus v rel log m final minus log m initial is equal to v final minus v initial. And so let's get rid of this negative sign by putting a negative there and a positive there. Now, when we do log m initial minus log m final, we can write that as a fraction. So inside the logarithm. So we've got v final minus v initial is equal to v rel times log m initial over m final. And so that'll tell us by how much our rocket has sped up. So let's have a look at the problem now. Okay, so in this problem, we have a rocket with an initial mass of 850 kilogram, which consumes fuel at a rate of 2.3 kilograms per second. The speed V rel of the exhaust gas relative to the rocket engine is 2,800 meters per second. And we want to know what thrust does the rocket engine provide? Okay, so we have our rocket equation that the mass times the acceleration of the rocket is equal to the rate of exhaust times the relative velocity of the fuel and this fuel being released is the only force that is driving this rocket forwards so this is also equal to the net force which is the thrust so this is equal to the thrust so all we need to do to calculate the thrust is substitute into this equation so this is equal to 2.3 kilograms per second times 2,800, which gives us 6,440 newtons, or we should probably give it to two significant figures, so 6,400 newtons. Okay, so we'll start by presenting a nice table which shows all the rotational variables and the translational ones so that we can draw these analogies. So we can see we've got displacement with the symbol S for the translational case, or sometimes D or X. And in the rotational case, the symbol is theta, and it's the angular displacement. We've got velocities and angular velocities. We have seen the symbol omega before when we were looking at circular motion. We've got an acceleration and an angular acceleration, which is the Greek letter alpha. We've got a force and we've got a torque, which is a kind of turning force. We've got mass, and then we've got a moment of inertia, which has the symbol capital letter I, and we'll be looking at how to calculate this later. We've also got momentum and an angular momentum. So let's look at this in a little more detail now. We're now going to consider rotational motion. Now, rotational motion, like this, can be a little bit overwhelming because of all the new symbols that are introduced. However, the basic physics underlying it is pretty much the same. So in this video, we're going to look at the analogy between the translational quantities, so that's the movement quantities that you've already seen, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, those types of things, and the rotational case.
And then when we look at rotation in more detail, you'll be able to see how really we're just reproducing pretty much the same equations with the analogous symbol in place. Okay, so first of all, in the translational case, when something moves through space, it has a displacement. In the rotational case, when we have something moving through an angle like this, it has an angular displacement. So we typically use the symbol theta to represent the angular position of the object, and then we can use delta theta to show the change in angle as the object moves. So if this is the initial angle and this is the final angle, then delta theta is just theta f minus theta i, the final angle minus the initial angle. Just as in displacement, we have that the change in displacement is equal to the final displacement minus the initial displacement, and we typically use s or x to represent our displacement. Now, when something is translating, it has a speed which, or a velocity, which we represent by the letter v, which tells us how quickly the displacement is changing. So we have the equation v is equal to dx dt, if we're just considering one dimension in the x direction. We have a completely analogous thing in rotation. So we have an angular speed or an angular velocity, which is given the symbol omega. And omega is equal to d theta dt. When something's moving through space, it can be accelerating. And acceleration is just dv dt, how quickly the velocity is changing. Or we can take the second derivative of the displacement, d squared x dt squared, for example. Well, the same thing with rotation. When something's rotating, it can start rotating at a faster and faster pace. I don't think I can turn it faster and faster, but if it's speeding up with time, then it will have an angular acceleration. This is represented by the Greek letter alpha, and alpha is equal to d omega dt, which is equal to the second derivative of theta. So this is d squared theta dt squared. So completely analogous. Now, those ones are fairly straightforward and easy to see. Some of the quantities are a little bit harder to see. So to start something moving, we need to apply a force to it. That's what Newton's first law tells us. An object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, if we want to get something turning, we need to apply a turning force to it, which is what's known as a torque. So torque is given the symbol tau, and it's analogous to force. Now, Newton's laws all have analogies too. So Newton's first law tells us an object at rest will remain at rest unless stacked upon by an unbalanced force. Well, Newton's first law for rotation says an object not rotating will remain not rotating unless acted upon by an unbalanced torque. And we have the similar rules for Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Now, another not so obvious one is mass. So the amount of force will accelerate an object and the amount of the acceleration will depend upon the mass of that object. Well, in rotational motion, rather than the mass, it's the moment of inertia that is important. So the moment of inertia is given the symbol i, and we'll look at more examples of how to calculate this later, but i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. So what this is telling us for rotation is that it's not just the amount of mass that it's that is important. It's also r, which is the distance from the pivot point, which is important. So if we have a mass further from the pivot point, then it's going to have a greater moment of inertia, and we are going to have to apply more torque in order to get it to move. And finally, in the translational case, we've seen that we have momentum. We've got a similar quantity called angular momentum in the rotational case. So hopefully using these analogies as you work through this topic will show you that really this is just the same thing again, just with slightly different letters. So these analogies actually follow through to the kinematic equations as well. So for example, we've got our kinematic equation V is equal to U plus AT. Now this has a rotational analogy. We can write omega, the angular speed, is equal to omega naught, the initial angular speed, plus the angular acceleration times time. 
Similarly, we can write v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. In the rotational case, it's omega squared is equal to omega naught squared plus 2 alpha theta, where theta is the total angle through which it's moved in radians. And finally, we've got s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, which we can again write as theta is equal to omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared. What we're going to look at now is how we can relate linear variables to angular ones. So we've seen the analogy between the two, but now we want equations which have both types of quantities in it so that we can convert from one type to another type. So when we're considering distances traveled, the way to do this is actually with the arc length of a circle. So if something's undergoing circular motion, moving in a circle, then it's tracing out a circular path. And so the distance it's traveled, s, is related to the angle it's turned through, theta, through our equation s is equal to theta r, where r is the radius of the circle s is the distance it's traveled through and theta is the angular displacement, so the total angle it has traveled through. Now to relate the velocity to the angular velocity, we can just differentiate this equation. So when we differentiate the distance it's traveled, we get the speed. So ds dt is equal to v. And then when we differentiate the right hand side, we've got the derivative of theta r with respect to time. Now, when we're considering something undergoing circular motion, the radius which it is at is not changing. So dr dt is just zero because r is a constant. So this tells us that when we're doing the derivative of theta times r, this is the same as r times d theta dt. And we've seen that d theta dt can just be written as omega. So this gives us the equation v is equal to r omega, which we saw when we were looking at circular motion previously. Now acceleration gets a little bit more confusing because we have two different types of acceleration. So before, when we were looking at uniform circular motion, which means circular motion where it's not speeding up, it's got a constant angular speed, we saw that the acceleration was directed back towards the center of the motion. So that is a radial acceleration, which we also call the centripetal acceleration. And the centripetal acceleration, same thing as the radial acceleration, is equal to v squared on r. So any object moving around the circle at any speed has a radial acceleration directed towards the center of the circle, which is given by v squared on r. If the velocity is changing, then this centripetal acceleration will also be changing with time. Now our equation v equals omega r tells us about the speed of the object around the circle. So to make this a velocity, we need to consider its direction. The speed was in a tangent to the circle. So that is a tangential speed around the circle. So if we now consider what happens when we differentiate our equation v is equal to omega r, because that's going to give us a acceleration type quantity, that needs to have the same direction as the velocity, because differentiating it isn't going to change its direction. So we have dv dt is equal to the tangential acceleration, so directed as a tangent to our circle, which is equal to d omega r dt, and once again, r is not changing, so we can pull it out the front of our derivative. So we've got r d omega dt, and we've seen that d omega t dt is equal to alpha. So we can say, well, the tangential acceleration is equal to r alpha. Now, for the case of uniform circular motion, the omega is not changing. So alpha, the angular acceleration, is zero, so we have no tangential acceleration. So for the uniform circular motion, we only had that radial acceleration given by v squared on r. But if something's starting to go faster and faster and faster, then it does have a tangential component. 
So we've got two types of acceleration at right angles to each other. We've got the radial directed towards the center and the tangential, which is a tangent to the circle. If we want to find the total acceleration of an object, which is rotating, then we need to add these two together, which because they're at right angles to each other, we can just do with Pythagoras' theorem. So this tells us that the magnitude of the total acceleration is just equal to the square root of the tangential acceleration squared plus the radial acceleration squared. So let's have a look at an example of a problem that we could solve using this now. The question is, the angular displacement of an object is described by theta is equal to 0 0.100 t cubed as it rotates about a pivot point 2.00 meters away. Part A, write an expression for the angular speed of the object. B, write an expression for the speed of the object. C, write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object. D, writing an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. E, what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the object? Okay, so we have that theta is equal to 0 0.100 t cubed and that the radius is equal to 2 meters. And in part A, we're asked to write an expression for the angular speed. So we want omega, which is equal to d theta dt. So we're differentiating our expression for theta here, which is 0 0.100 t cubed with respect to t. So this is just differentiating something which is cubed. So we end up with 3 times 0 0.100 t squared. So the 3 comes from the initial cube here, which we move down the front when we differentiate it. So this is equal to 0 0.300 t squared. Part B then asks us to write an expression for the speed of the object. So the speed V is equal to omega R. And we just calculated omega in part A. So omega was 0 0.300 T squared times R, which was 2 meters. So this is equal to 0 0.600 T squared as our speed. Part C then asks us to write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object. So the radial acceleration is the same thing as the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared on R. And we've just calculated V squared in part B. So that's 0 0.600 T squared or squared on R, which is 2. So solving this, we end up with 0 0.180 T to the 4. Okay, let's just scroll up to give ourselves a little bit more room to finish this off. Part D then asks us to write an expression for the tangential acceleration. Okay, so the tangential acceleration is equal to dv dt because the velocity was tangential. And so this is equal to d omega r dt, which is equal to r d omega dt, which is equal to 2 because 2 is r times d omega and omega we found in part a. So this was 0 0.300 t squared dt. So this is 2 times the 2 and that second 2 comes from here. That's that one. This one's this one. And then we times 0 0.300 times t. And so this is equal to 1.20 t. And then finally, part E asks us what's the magnitude of the acceleration of the object. So the acceleration is equal to, we've got the square root of the radial acceleration squared plus the tangential acceleration squared. And this is just using Pythagoras because the radial and the tangential are at right angles to each other. So we can just substitute in here our answers from C and D. So we've got the square root of 0 0.180 t to the 4 squared plus 1.20 t squared. So we have got the square root of 0 0.0324 t to the 8 plus 1.44 t squared. Let's pull t squared out as a common factor. 
And then because we're taking the square root of it, we can pull it all the way out the front as t because the square root of t squared is t. So we can put t, just scrolling up, we can put t out the front and then we've got the square root of 0 0.0324 and we've got t to the 6 left plus 1.44. So there's our expression for the magnitude of the acceleration of the object. We're now going to consider rotational inertia, which is also known as the moment of inertia, and it's written with the symbol capital I. The moment of inertia of a body relates to how hard it is to start the body spinning. So how much torque we have to apply to get it to start turning. So when you think about it intuitively, you know that if we have two masses which are quite far from a pivot point, like in this case here, it's a little harder to get it to spin than if we move the masses closer to the center. In this case, I can apply less torque, which is the turning force, in order to get it turning. So to come up with an expression for I, the moment of inertia, we're going to consider the kinetic energy of a body as it rotates. So let's just slide these back along. Let's consider this body here. We've got two masses. Let's assume to make it simple that this bar is massless and that it's rotating like this. Now, from what we've learnt before, we know that because this is absolutely symmetric, the centre of mass is right in the middle. So as I turn it, that centre of mass is not moving. So while this is rotating like this, it has no translational kinetic energy. But it's incorrect to say that it has absolutely no kinetic energy at all, because parts of it are moving. These two masses on the end are moving so they must have some form of kinetic energy so the type of kinetic energy that they have is known as rotational kinetic energy so if i want it to have translational kinetic energy then i actually have to move it through space like this but while it's just stationary it has only the rotational kinetic energy okay so let's look at how we can calculate the size of this kinetic energy so let's consider just one mass here. Let's call this one mass one, and on the other end we have mass two. At the moment I'm rotating it about the center, but I don't necessarily have to. So let's call the distance from the pivot point to mass one, R1, and the distance from the pivot point to mass two, R2. So the pivot point is the point about which I am turning it. So when it's turned, then mass one here has kinetic energy given by a half mass one times the speed of mass one squared. But it's moving in a circle, so we know that V is equal to omega R, and in this case we've got V1, and it's at radius R1. And so we can say, well, the kinetic energy of mass one is given by a half M omega R1 all squared. And so that's equal to a half m1 r1 squared times omega squared. Now for mass 2, it's rotating at the same rate because they're all connected to this one body which is all rotating at the same rate. So by rotating at the same rate, we mean they've got the same omega. So omega is the same for everything attached to this body. So the kinetic energy for our second mass, mass 2, is given by a half m2 r2 squared times omega squared and so the total kinetic energy as it rotates assuming that my bar is massless is given by a half m1 r1 squared omega squared plus a half m2 r2 squared omega squared so we can write this as a half times m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared times omega squared now, if we imagined having lots of separate masses along my bar, then as I rotate it, they all rotate at the same rate. So they've all got the same omega. And we could say, well, that the total kinetic energy is equal to a half times the sum over all the masses of the mi, which is the, the mass that a particular mass has, times ri squared, the distance of that particular mass from the pivot point, or times omega squared. 
Now, previously we've been looking at the analogy between translational quantities and rotational quantities. So for the translational case, we know that the translational kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared. And here for the rotational case, we've got that our rotational kinetic energy is given by a half times the sum over i, mi ri squared, times omega squared. And we know that the angular equivalent of the velocity is the angular velocity, omega. And so it suggests that that sum is something special and is equivalent to the mass. So that sum is in fact our moment of inertia. So we can say, well, the moment of inertia i is equal to the sum of mi ri squared summed over all the little masses involved. So that's what our moment of inertia is. Now let's at this point assume that our rod is no longer massless. If we wanted to work out the moment of inertia of this rod as we pivoted it about one end say, what we'd need to do was sum up the contribution of each of the little points along the rod. And so when we do that, we're going from a sum into an integral, because an integral is just a sum where we break it into really small components. So for continuous bodies, we can say the moment of inertia is given by the integral of r squared dm, which is equivalent to our sum over i of mi times ri squared. So now we've seen what the moment of inertia is, let's have a look at how to calculate it for a few different shapes. So let's start with the simple case of two masses, both mass m and each a distance r from the pivot point about which the system turns. So in this case, because we've got discrete masses rather than a continuous mass, we're assuming here that this bar is massless, we can say, well, i, the moment of inertia, is equal to the sum over lowercase i, mi ri squared, which in this case, we've just got the two masses, both at the same radius r. So this is equal to mr squared plus mr squared, which is all equal to 2mr squared. So that is how we calculate the moment of inertia of two point masses. Now let's consider a rod. A rod is a little bit more complicated because it is a continuous mass distribution. We've got mass all the way along the rod. So we're going to make the assumption for our rod that it has a constant linear density. So the linear density is the same all the way along the rod. Now, linear density, we tend to represent in physics by the symbol lambda, and it is literally the mass of the rod. So if I weighed my ruler on scales and got that mass, that mass divided by the length of the rod. So in this case, it's a meter ruler. So that length would be one meter. So lambda is equal to m on L. Now, later in other topics, you may also see surface density, which we usually give the symbol sigma to, and the surface density is equal to the mass divided by the surface area. Or there's the volume density, which is what you're probably used to referring to density as. The, surf the volume density is usually represented by the Greek letter rho, and it's equal to the mass over the volume. But when we're considering something where the mass is just spread out evenly in one dimension, it's easiest to use the linear density. Okay, so what we'll need to do in this case is use our formula to calculate the moment of inertia. We'll be using i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. And if this rod is pivoted about one end, we'll be breaking our meter ruler, in this case, up into little increments, each with length dl and mass dm. And then we'll be summing up those increments all along the rod to get our total moment of inertia. Okay, so we're considering a rod which is pivoted about one end like this. So in our formula for the moment of inertia, i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. r represents the distance from the pivot point. So this is our pivot axis here. So this end here is at r equals zero. 
And this end here is at r equals l if our rod has a length l, which we're assuming it does. And we'll let the rod have a mass m. Now, what we want to do is approach this question much like we approach the center of mass problem. So what we'll do is consider a little increment of the rod here. So we'll let this little increment have a length dr and a mass dm and it is a distance r from our pivot point. And what we want to do is work out, well, how does this little bit, yeah. and we want to work out, well, how does this little bit contribute to the moment of inertia? Well, it contributes a little bit. So the little bit it contributes is di, and that is equal to its distance from the pivot point squared. So this is r squared, not dr. dr is the length of the increment, but in our moment of inertia formula here, this term is referring to the distance from the pivot point. So that's an r squared. There's no dr there. And then it's times the mass of this little increment. And we've said, well, that little increment has a mass dm. So this is how much that little increment contributes to the moment of inertia. So now if we want to work out the total moment of inertia along the rod, what we're going to need to do is sum together all of these little increments. So we will then have, well, i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. And in this case, we're summing from one end of the rod, which is at r equals zero, up to the other end of the rod, which is at r equals l. And now we've got this r squared dm in here, which is a bit inconvenient to deal with because we've got a dm and an r and how does r relate to dm we'd need to know that in order to be able to solve this integral so in order to work out how they relate and useful quantity is the linear density so the linear density has the symbol lambda and this is the linear density and it is equal to the mass divided by the length. So we've got both the mass and the length in this case. Now there's a couple of other densities that you will come across in physics. We've got a surface density, which is represented by sigma, which is equal to the mass divided by the area. And then we've got our usual density, which you've seen before, rho. This is equal to the volume density. and it is equal to the mass divided by the volume. But the one we want to use right now is lambda is equal to m on l. And how this helps is, well, that lets us come up with the amount of mass that little increment dr has. So we can write, well, the mass of something, just rearranging this formula, is equal to lambda times l. So that tells us that the mass of our little increment is equal to lambda times the length of our increment, which we've said is dr. So now we've got a relationship between dm and dr. Now, in this case, we were assuming that our rod had a uniform density, so lambda is just a constant. It is possible to get questions where lambda is varying. So if a rod is getting, say, thicker as you move along its length, then it will get heavier as you move along its length. And lambda could be some function of the distance from the pivot point r instead of just a constant. But we'll just stick to the nice case where it is constant. So what we want to do now is substitute this expression here into here. So we end up with i is equal to the integral. And our integral is now we've still got our r squared, but we're going to replace dr, sorry, we're going to replace dm with lambda dr. And our limits are from r equals 0 to r equals l. And that's good now. Our limits are in terms of this variable here, the dr. So that's what we wanted. Now, because lambda is just a constant, we can pull it out the front of our integral. So we have lambda times the integral from 0 to L of r squared dr. So we have lambda. Now, integrating r squared, we have r cubed on 3, and we're going from 0 to L. So this is equal to lambda times L cubed on 3. When we substitute in the 0, we just end up with 0. 
Okay, so that's a fairly nice expression, but we can make it a little bit nicer by looking up the top here. We said lambda was equal to m on l. So I'm going to replace this lambda now with m on l. So I've got m on l times l cubed on 3. So these l's cancel and I end up with ml squared on 3. So I equals ml squared on 3 is the moment of inertia of a rod which is pivoted about one end. So what we're going to look at now is how we can derive an expression for the moment of inertia of a disk. So we're going to start by considering a disk. The disk we're considering has a total mass capital M, a radius capital R, and a height H. So we're going to be calculating the moment of inertia I, which we've seen before is equal to R squared dm. And so with our disk, we're going to break it up into little rings. So let's consider a little ring like this and our little ring has a width here dr and it's located a distance r from the pivot point from the center of the disk about which the disk is spinning. So in order to substitute into this equation here to work out how this little ring contributes, we need to know the mass of the little ring. So dm is equal to mass of little ring, and that will be equal to the density of the ring, which we're assuming And that will be equal to the density of the disk, which we're assuming is uniform. So assume uniform density times the volume of our little ring. So let's work out now what the density is and what the volume of this little ring is. So let's start with the density first. So the density for the disk is equal to the mass of the disk divided by the volume of the disk. Now we're told that the mass of the disk is capital M, so we've got that. And now we just need to work out the volume of the disk. So this disk has a surface area pi r squared because that's the surface area of a circle and then to get its volume we just times it by the height of the disk which is h. So the density of the disk is given by m over pi r squared h. Okay now what we need to do is calculate the volume of just this little ring here. So dv, let's imagine if we can taking this little disk, uh, this little disk here and spreading it out. So it is a rectangle when we spread it out. It's got a width dr along here. So that's this width here. We've just uncurled it. It's got a length here equal to the circumference of the circle. So this length here is 2 pi r and it's got the same height as our disk, so it's got height h. So hopefully from considering it this way, you can see that the volume is going to be given by 2 pi r h times dr. So now that we've got the volume and the density, we can work out dm. So dm is just multiplying these two things together. So we've got the density, which is capital M over pi r squared h, and then times the volume of our little ring. So 2 pi r h dr. Now some things will cancel out. We can cancel out our pi. We can cancel out our h. These r's are different r's. So this R here shows the distance of our little ring from the pivot point, the center of the disk. This capital R, that's the total radius of the disk. So this is equal to 2m r dr over r squared. So now that we've got dm in terms of r, we can substitute it into our equation up here 
for the moment of inertia of a disk. So we've got the total moment of inertia. Now we will want to sum up our little rings right from the center with radius zero to the outer radius, which is capital R. And then we've still got the R squared. This R squared is this R squared at the start times dm, which is 2m r dr over r squared. Now let's pull the constant terms out the front. So out the front we've got our 2m on r squared. This is capital R, so it's not a variable, it's the total radius. And then we're integrating from 0 to r, and we've got little r squared times little r, so that's r cubed dr. So doing this integration, we've got the 2m on r squared, and then when we integrate r cubed, we end up with r to the 4 on 4. And this is from 0 to capital R. So now we can substitute this in. And we've got 2m on r squared times r to the 4 on 4. When we substitute in the 0, we just get 0. So when we subtract that off, it doesn't change it. Okay, so let's just simplify this a bit. We've got an r squared here, so we can cancel that with two of the r's here. So we've got an r squared here. We've got a 2 here, which will cancel with this 4 to leave 2. So this is equal to m r squared on 2, or a half m r squared. And we've now derived the moment of inertia of a disk. Now another thing it's useful to know the moment of inertia of is a sphere. The derivation of this one is more complicated, so I'm not going to include it in this video. However, I have made a separate video covering it, which you've got the link to here. So in this video, we show that the moment of inertia of a sphere, when it's turned about the central axis, is given by 2 fifths mr squared. So a problem, a 5 kilogram block with a speed of 3 meters per second collides with a 10 kilogram block that has a speed of 2 meters per second in the same direction. After the collision, the 10 kilogram block travels in the original direction with a speed of 2.5 meters per second. Part 1. What is the velocity of the 5 kilogram block immediately after the collision? Part 2. By how much does the total kinetic energy of the system of the two blocks change because of the collision? Part 3. Suppose instead that the 10 kilogram block ends up with a speed of 4 meters per second. What then is the change in kinetic energy? And part 4. Account for the result you obtained in C. So a good way to start this problem is start by drawing a diagram. So let's draw here what happens initially. So we've got one block here and we're told that it has a mass of five kilograms and we'll call that block one. And it's traveling with a speed of three meters per second. And then we have a second block, which is going in the same direction. So this is block two and it has a mass of 10 kilograms and it's traveling in the same direction at two meters per second. Then we're told that after the collision, so let's draw a final diagram over here. We've got this second block, the 10 kilogram block, traveling in the original direction, but now it's got a speed of 2.5 meters per second and we've got the first block still five kilograms and we don't know which what its velocity is. So in part A of the question, we're asked, what is the velocity of the five kilogram block immediately after the collision? So we'll assume that during the collision, momentum is conserved. So assume that during the collision, momentum is conserved. So we can write m1u1 plus m2u2 is equal to m1v1 plus m2v2, which what we're trying to find is this v1. So we can rearrange this and write, well, v1 is equal to m1u1 plus m2u2 minus m2v2 and this is all divided by m1. And now we know everything here, so we can just substitute in. So here we're going to do five times three. That's the initial speed and 
velocity of block one and then we've got plus 10 times 2 minus 10 times 2.5 all over the mass of block one which is 5 kilograms now solving that on the calculator we end up with 2 meters per second and that's a positive number so it's in the same direction now part b of the question asks us by how much does the total kinetic energy of the system of the two blocks change because of the collision so the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy so that's equal to a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared minus a half m1 u1 squared plus a half m2 u2 squared and we can just substitute into this so we've got a half times five times v1 which we just calculated so that's our two and that's squared plus a half times m2 so that's 10 times v2 which we were told was 2.5 minus a half times five times three squared plus a half times 10 times two squared then we solve this on the calculator and we end up with minus 1.25, which we can write as minus 1.3 joules. So this tells us that 1.3 joules, i.e. 1.3 joules is lost during the collision. Okay, part C then says, suppose that instead that the 10 kilogram block ends up with a speed of four meters per second. Okay, so let's do this in red. So rather than 2.5 meters per second, it's now going at four meters per second. And we're then asked, what is the change in total kinetic energy? So we need to calculate the change in total kinetic energy again, which we'll use this same formula for as we used up here. So we'll use this equation down here. But the difficulty is that we're given V2, but we're going to have to calculate V1 again, because if the final velocity of the second block has changed, then the final velocity of the first block will also change. So we shall need to substitute into this equation again in order to calculate V1 again. So V1 is going to be equal to five times three, plus 10 times two, the initial conditions didn't change, but now we've got minus 10 times four, because that final velocity is different, and then divided by five. And when we solve that one on the calculator, we end up with minus 1.0 meters per second. So now this block is going back in the opposite direction. That's what our negative sign indicates at 1.0 meters per second. So now we can substitute into our equation up here. So we've got a half times five times one squared. We could put minus one squared if we want, but when we square the negative sign, it disappears. So I just haven't bothered writing it down. So plus a half times 10 times four squared minus, same thing, a half times five times three squared plus a half times 10 times two squared. And then we solve that one on the calculator and we end up with, 40 joules. So this tells us that this time it's gained 40 joules of energy. So in part D, it says account for your, your result obtained in C. So let's just scroll up a bit. I mean, the surprising thing, the surprising thing is that this is positive so that indicates that it's gained kinetic energy so this energy has to come from somewhere e.g an explosion so we can't just create energy out of nothing it has to have been stored somewhere so it could have been stored in chemical potential energy and then an explosion took place and it was converted into kinetic energy for example so the next problem as shown in the figure 
block one with a mass m1 slides from left along a frictionless ramp from a height h which is 2.5 meters and then collides with stationary block two which has mass m2. After the collision, block two slides into a region where the coefficient of kinetic friction is mu k which is 0 0.500 and comes to a stop in distance d within that region. And then we're asked, what is the value of the distance d in meters if the collision is a elastic or b completely inelastic? Okay, so in this problem, it's a bit complicated. We've got a block which slides down a ramp. It's got mass m1 and it slides down a height h. So as it slides down, its potential energy goes into kinetic energy and so at the bottom of the slope, we can write, well, mgh, m1, gh, because we'll call this one mass 1, is equal to a half m1, and we'll call it u1 squared, because this, as far as we're concerned, is the velocity before the collision, so our initial velocity in this case. So we can cancel out this m1s, and we can rearrange this, and this tells us that u1 squared is equal to 2gh, which tells us that u1 is equal to the square root of 2gh. So we now know the speed of block 1 when it gets to the bottom of the slope. Now at the bottom of the slope, some interesting stuff happens. It collides with block, block 2, which then goes along this area with friction, and the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, is equal to 0 0.500. And in part A, we have an elastic collision. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide the page in half and we'll do part B here, which is completely inelastic. Okay, so in an elastic collision, in any collision, momentum is conserved. So we've got m1 u1 plus m2 u2 is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. Now in this collision, m2 is initially, initially stationary, which tells us that u2 is equal to 0. So this term here is equal to 0. We're also told in the question that m2 is equal to 2 m1. So... For this case, we've got m1 u1 is equal to m1 v1 plus 2 m1 v2. Just substituting in uh, mass 2 here. And so the m1s occur in every term, so cancel out. So we end up with u1 is equal to v1 plus 2 v2. And we calculated up here that this was equal to the square root of 2gh. So that's what we get by considering the conservation of momentum. But because it's elastic, kinetic energy is also conserved. So we've got kinetic energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final. And initial is just before block 1 collides. Final is just after block 1 hits block 2. So we've got a half m1u1 squared. Now, block 2 is initially, initially stationary, so that's 0. And this is equal to a half m1v1 squared plus a half m2v2 squared. And let's substitute in this mass 2 is 2 mass 1. So this is a half mass 1v1 squared plus a half 2m1v2 squared. Okay, now in every single term here, we've got a half m1. So we can cancel all those out. So a half m1, we can do it in these middle ones too, but we don't have to yet. Yeah, let's get rid of all those. Okay, now what we're going to do is rearrange up here, and we have v1 is equal to u1 minus 2v2. And then we'll substitute this in here for this v1 squared. So we have u1 squared is equal to u1 minus 2v2 squared plus 2v2 squared. So this is equal to u1 squared minus 4u1v2 
plus 4v2 squared plus 2v2 squared. So the u1 squareds on each side cancel out and we end up with 4u1v2 is equal to 6v2 squared. We can cancel 1v2 from each side and we end up with v2 is equal to 4u1 on 6. But then u1 we've calculated up here as the square root of 2gh. So 4 divided by 6, that's the same as 2 over 3 times the square root of 2gh. So we have now calculated the velocity of the second block as it enters the spot with the friction. So now we have the speed of block 2 when it comes to this rough spot and we lose and we lose all kinetic energy as work against friction. So that tells us that a half m2 v2 squared is equal to the work done against friction which is mu k m g that's the frictional force times the distance it travels over because work is equal to f dot s where s is the displacement okay and what we're trying to do is find d and this is m2 here it's the mass of block two Okay, so let's rearrange this to make D the subject because that's what we're trying to find, the distance it's gone. So when we're doing this, this is mass 2 because it's the mass of block 2. So those will cancel and I end up with, well, D is equal to V2 squared over 2. And then we've still got the mu K and we've got this G. Okay, so now we've calculated V2 just above, so we can square that and substitute it in. So 2 thirds squared, that's 4 ninths. Square root of 2gh squared, that's 2gh. And then we're dividing by 2 mu k g. So these 2s cancel out, these g's cancel out, and we end up with 4 ninths h over mu k. Now we're given h and mu k in the question, h is 2.5 so this is 4 over 9 times 2.5 over 0 0.5 and solving that we get 2.22 meters so that's the case for the elastic collision now in the second part we're asked about the completely inelastic case so for the completely inelastic case the two blocks stick together and we have v1 is equal to v2 is equal to v now the conservation of momentum is still the same so we've still got this part here but in this case we've got well u1 is equal to v plus 2v so that's equal to 3v and u1 is still equal to the square root of 2gh because that we got up the top here just from the potential energy considerations so this tells us that well in this case v is equal to the square root of 2gh on 3. now once we've got the speed we can do what we did down here again to calculate how far it goes because we've got a half now in this case we've got the two blocks stuck together so we'll put m1 plus m2 times v squared so this gives us the kinetic energy of these two blocks just before they hit the rough spot. And then all this kinetic energy is lost doing work against friction. So that's mu k m1 plus m2 g d. These cancel. And once again, I've got the same expression. I've got d is equal to v squared over 2 mu k g. And now I can substitute in my V. So this is equal to 2GH over 9 times 2 mu k G. My G's will cancel out. These 2's will cancel out. And so I end up with H over 9 mu k. So it's similar to before, but before we had a factor of 4 out the front. So this is a quarter of what it was before. So we can then substitute in, we've got 2.5 over 9 times 0 0.500. So this is equal to 0 0.556 meters. Okay, so that's how we solve that problem.
So in this problem, a 6,090 kilogram space probes moving nose first towards Jupiter at 105 meters per second relative to the sun. It fires its rocket engine. Um, there's an ejection of 80 kilograms of exhaust at a speed of 253 meters per second relative to the space probe. And we're asked, what is the final velocity of the probe? So in this problem, we've got a space probe with an initial mass of 6,090 kilograms. It's initially heading towards Jupiter with a speed of 105 meters per second. It then exhausts some fuel. Its change in mass, so the amount of fuel it exhausts, is equal to 80 kilograms. And the velocity of the fuel relative to the space probe is 253 meters per second and we're asked what's the final speed of the space probe so we derived the expression that the final velocity minus the initial velocity is equal to the relative velocity of the exhaust to the um, probe in this case um, times log of the initial mass over the final mass so we've got almost all of these things the final mass is going to be equal to the initial mass minus the change in the mass. So let's rearrange this. We have the final mass is equal to the initial mass plus the relative speed, sorry, the initial speed plus the relative speed times log initial mass over initial mass minus delta m. Now we've got absolutely everything here, so we can just substitute in. So this is equal to 105 plus 253 times log of 6090 over 6090 minus 80. 6090 minus 80 is 6010. So we can put that all into the calculator and we end up with 108 meters per second and that'll be towards Jupiter. So in this problem we're asked to find the so in this problem, we're told that the angular speed of an object is given by the expression omega is equal to 2t plus 3 radians per second. And we're told that at t equals 0, the object is at theta equals 0. And we're told that the object moves around a path with a radius of 3 meters. And in part A, we're asked to write an expression for the angular displacement of the object. Part B, write an expression for the angular acceleration of the object. Part C, write an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. Part D, write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object and E, write an expression for the magnitude of the acceleration of the object, and you do not need to simplify your expression. So in this one, we're told that omega is equal to 2t plus 3.0, so that's the angular speed, and at t equals 0, theta is equal to 0, and the object moves around a path with a radius of 3 meters. And in the first part, we're asked to write an expression for the angular displacement of the object. So what we're trying to find is an expression for theta. So we know how theta is related to omega. We know that omega is equal to d theta dt. So we can rearrange this and we have omega dt is equal to d theta. But we're told what omega is. It's equal to 2t plus 3. And then that's dt, which is equal to d theta. Okay, so to get this expression, we're going to want to integrate to get rid of our little derivatives, our d's here. So we're going from t equals 0 up to t equals t. And we know at time 0, theta is 0. We're told that. And at time t, theta is theta. So now we can integrate this. When we integrate 2t, we end up with t squared. And then we integrate 3, we end up with 3t. And this is at 0 and t. And on the right-hand side here, we've just got our theta from 0 to theta. So when we substitute in, we've got t squared plus 3t is equal to theta. So that is our expression for theta there. Now, part B asks us to write an expression for the angular acceleration. So now we're asked to find, well, what's alpha? So alpha is equal to d omega dt. So we just have to differentiate 2t plus 3 with respect to 
time. And when we do that, when we differentiate 2t, we just end up with 2. And when we differentiate 3, that goes to 0 because it's just a constant. So our angular acceleration is equal to 2 radians per second per second. And then part C asks us to write an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. Okay, so we know that the tangential acceleration is related to the angular acceleration through the equation that the tangential acceleration is equal to alpha r. Now, we've just calculated alpha and we're given r, so this isn't too hard. So we've got 2 times 3, and that is equal to 6 meters per second per second. Now, in part D, we're asked for the radial acceleration. So the radial acceleration is the same thing as the centripetal acceleration. And we saw when we were looking at circular motion that that is equal to omega squared r. And up here, we've got our omega. So this is 2t plus 3. And then that squared, that's omega squared, times r, which is 3 meters. So let's expand our brackets because that's fun. So 2 squared, that's 4t squared plus 3 times 2, that's 6. And then there's two of them, so that is equal to 12. And then plus 3 squared, which is 9, and then times 3. And so this is equal to 12t squared plus 3 times 12, so that's plus 36t plus 3 times 9, which is 27. And so that is our radial acceleration. So that's directed back towards the center of the circle, whereas the tangential one is directed at a tangent to the circle. Okay, and then finally E asks us to write an expression for the magnitude of the acceleration. And we're told that we don't need to simplify this expression, which is nice of the question to say that. So the magnitude of our acceleration, we've got the radial one which is going back towards the center and we've got our tangential one which is at right angles to it a tangent so to get the magnitude of the acceleration we just need to use pythagoras here so we've got the radial squared plus the tangential squared and we've calculated both these things so the radial squared that is equal to 12.0 t squared plus 36.0 t plus 27 and then we've got plus 6 squared. So 6 squared is 36. That's squared. Left off that squared. Okay, so we could go ahead and expand the brackets and everything, but it told us that we didn't have to bother simplifying it. So let's leave it in that format. So in this problem, we're told the bar starts from rest and rotates with constant angular acceleration about an axis located in the middle of the bar to reach an angular speed of omega in t seconds. The bar has a moment of inertia I. For a bar of length L and mass M pivoted through its center, the moment of inertia is given by 1 12th ML. And we're asked to, in part one, write an expression for the angular acceleration of the bar. Okay, so I think the easiest way to do this is to recall our kinematic equation V is equal to U plus AT and use the rotational form of this. So the rotational form of this tells us that omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t and it's alpha that we've been asked to find and we've been told about omega in the question and we know that it starts from rest. So if it's starting from rest, omega naught must be equal to zero. So this thing's zero. So this tells us that, well, alpha is equal to omega over t. So that's an expression in terms of the variables given in the question, because in the question we're told omega and we are told t. Now in part two, it asks us the angle in radians through which it rotates in this time. So again, let's recall our kinematic equation, s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, and translate this into the rotational case where we've got theta is equal to omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared. But we know that omega naught is zero, we discussed that up there, so this one's zero. So we've got theta is equal to a half times alpha, which is omega over t, times t squared. So this is just equal to a half omega t. And then part three, we're asked what net force is acting on the bar over this time. Well, there is no net force. There's a net torque because it's starting to turn, but we're not told anything about a force acting upon it. So no net force. Don't need a net force to start 
it rotating just in that top so that tells us that net force is equal to zero Okay, so in this problem, we're asked to derive an expression for the moment of inertia of a rod of length L and mass M pivoted through its center. So let's draw a little diagram. So we're pivoting through the center this way. So it'll be rotating that way. So we've got a length L on two here, and this one here is going to be minus L on two. And what we want to do is consider a little increment, which is a distance X along, and it's got width dx and we'll be using our moment of inertia is equal to the integral of r squared dm so we're going to need to know well what's the math what's the mass of this little increment so we can say well the linear density of the rod is equal to the mass of the rod divided by the length and we know that the mass of this little bit here dm is equal to the linear density times dx which is equal to m over l dx. Now let's consider first of all just half the rod and then since the rod's perfectly symmetric both halves are going to contribute equally to the total moment of inertia. So moment of inertia of half the rod. So we want to use i is equal to the integral and here we're going from x equals 0 up to x is equal to L on 2. So from 0 to L on 2, and we're using x instead of r here. So x squared times dm, which is equal to m over L dx. So we can write this as m over L times the integral from 0 to L on 2 of x squared dx, which is equal to m over L times when we integrate x squared we get x cubed on 3 from 0 to l on 2 and so this is equal to m over l now we've got x cubed so that's l cubed over 2 cubed which is 8 and then times 1 on 3 and so one of these l's will cancel and we end up with m l squared over 24. now this was just for this half this other half contributes equally so total i is equal to 2 times i for half whereas this is i for half and so this is equal to double this so when we double this we end up with ml squared over 12 as the moment of inertia of a rod pivoted about its center so you can see this is different to the equation when the rod was pivoted about one end so the moment of inertia really does depend on where the mass distribution is pivoted